Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Stories by the Fireside, brought to you by the Indian Pueblo Culture Center's Museum Cultural Education Programs. We'd also like to thank the Urban Enhancement Trust Project through the City of Albuquerque for your support. I'm Shannon Romero, your host for this evening. My tribes include Cochiti, Pueblo, Kiwa, and Diné. Storytelling is an important part of Indigenous cultures. Storytelling can include a tribe's emergent stories, historical events, and astronomical occurrences. Some stories include our animal relatives. These stories serve purpose. They teach us about our past ways of life and core values. Stories are often passed down from generation to generation and can have different variations depending on what tribe and community you come from. Tonight's show will include storytelling from Akama, Zuni and Sandia Pueblos. We hope you enjoy tonight's stories. Thank you for joining us. Kawatsi haupa, tushinome itsatsu witsa eeshte jami honoshuta. Greetings everyone, my name is Stephanie Oyenki and I'm from the Pueblo of Akuma. Tonight I'm here to tell you about some stories from my community. I remember being a young girl and my mom telling me these stories and over time and as I got older, I asked her to repeat these stories. And so it is in our stories that tell us lessons on how to treat ourselves, how to treat others. And our stories tell us about core values like respect, community, love, and generosity. And so there's many core values that will be played out throughout this story, and I hope you enjoy it. My story is titled, How the Stars Came to Be. During the early days when birds, land animals, bugs, and the world were being created, there at Aku, or Akamo Pueblo, was an old man named Tziwaish. He received a message that he needed to deliver a package to his brother who lived on the other side of the world. Old man Tziwaish had beautiful white hair. His skin was the color of the mesas and sandstone rock formations. His favorite color to wear was pink and turquoise. He wore pink because it was the color of the sunsets and sunrises and he liked the color turquoise because his favorite necklace was made of turquoise beads. Before the sun rose that morning, he told his wife that he was going on this long journey and he would return in several months. So being concerned for her husband, she packed him deer jerky, parched corn, and his favorite water jug. She gave him a big hug and told him to be careful on his journey. He waved her goodbye and opened his front door, and on the ground was his package. The package was heavy and brown, made of buckskin. He swung the bag around his head and across his neck. Just as he did this, the sun was beginning to rise. He walked a distance and could see Aku in the background. He waved to his wife one more time and continued on his journey. He traveled many days and many nights, watching the sun rise and set and the moon rise and set. He couldn't see Aku anymore. But in the distance, he saw Tsushk, or Coyote, moving around the mesas. He didn't pay any attention and continued on. One day, he came across a big boulder and was going to sit next to it, when all of a sudden, he heard laughing and giggling. He turned the corner of the boulder and he saw two spider brothers playing. They were taking turns tumbling down the boulder. Old man Zuwaish was so happy to see them. He shouted, hello. Spider said, hello, where are you going today? Old man Zuwaish said, I am headed to the other side of the world to deliver this package to my brother. Spider brothers asked, what is in the bag? Can we take a look? Tziwaish said, I do not know the contents of this bag. I'm in a hurry and I wasn't planning on resting. Well, have a good day tumbling. 
Spider soon lost interest in Old Man and continued to play on the boulder. Old Man Tsuwaish continued onto his journey once again. Again, he traveled many days and many nights, and on one particular evening, when the sun was setting, he saw some tall grass and saw Rabbit nibbling at the shoots of grass. He was happy to greet Rabbit, and he decided to join him and take a small break. Old Man Tsuwaish pulled some deer jerky out. Rabbit and him were exchanging their own stories when Tsushk entered into the conversation. Tsushk asked, I have been wondering why you have been carrying that heavy brown bag. Do you want to take it off your shoulders for a while? Old man said, well, I have to take this package to my brother who lives on the other side of the world, and I need to be going now. He continued along his journey, waving to Rabbit and Sushk. Sushk went back to the mesas. Clouds started to form in the distance and there was a big shower of rain. Tsuwai continued through the rain, knowing he still had a long ways to go. He came upon a puddle of rain and decided to stop to fill his water jug and drink some fresh rainwater. Pretty soon, Robin flew down from the sky and landed by the puddle of rainwater. They both were happy that it had rained because they were very thirsty. Zushk was also thirsty. Zushk asked old man Tsuwaish once again, Is your bag heavy? You can take it off your shoulders now if you want to. What's inside that bag anyway? Old man Tsuwaish said, I do not know the contents of this bag. I have to deliver this to my brother. Zushk said, I just want to peek inside the bag. Old man said, I have to take this package to, the, to my brother and he is the only one who gets to see what is inside. I must be going now. See you all later. Old man waved to Robin and Sushk. He continued on his journey for many days and nights without stopping. And pretty soon he came to Squirrel jumping in and out of some bushes for some berries. He stopped and asked Squirrel, what's for lunch? Squirrel said, these berries are so hard to reach. If only I had longer arms. Zush came down from the mesas to see what was going on. Zush told Squirrel, ask old old man Tsuwaish to help you. Tell him he can reach those berries if he takes off his bag, and that way I can take a quick peek inside. Tsuwaish managed to help Squirrel get the berries without taking off his bag. Squirrel was so happy stuffing his cheeks with as much berries as he could and scurried away. Zushk went back to the mesas. Since old man Tsuwaish had traveled for many days and many nights, which turned into months, he decided to stop one evening and camp. He built a fire. He took out his deer jerky and parched corn and washed down his food with rainwater. He was thinking of all the social events he was missing at Aaku and especially his wife. He decided to sit down near a rock for a while and he found himself starting to sing. He was tapping his hand against his leg and pretty soon his foot started tapping on the ground, creating a beat. His singing brought all the animals he had encountered along the way. The Spider Brothers, Rabbit, Robin, and Squirrel all came to listen to his harvest songs. Old Man Tsuwaish sang many songs that evening. His shoulders became tired and he thought to himself, let me place this bag on this rock for a bit. The crackling fire was hot and warm. Pretty soon, Old Man Tsuwaish was yawning and his eyes grew heavy and pretty soon his eyes were closed. He went to sleep. Zushk saw his chance to take a peek inside. He hurriedly came down from the mesas and he asked the animals, do you all want to see what is inside this bag? All the animals replied, we heard him say that he was taking that bag to his brother on the other side of the world. No one was supposed to see what is inside that bag, only his brother. 
Zushk said, I just want to take a quick peek. All the animals were shouting at Zuwaish to wake up, but he was so tired. Zush got closer to the bag and started to untie the string with his teeth and pull the string with his mouth. When all of a sudden there came this loud rumble from the bag, all the animals were frozen still. Zush pulled the bag open more and more loud rumble came from the bag. And then the ground started to shake. Zush kept opening the bag as fast as he, as he could with his teeth and paws when noise inside the bag sounded like firecrackers. Pop, pop, pop. The animals started to cover their ears. It was so loud. Zush opened the bag more and this time out came shooting bright light that seemed to float and disappear in the sky. Then all of a sudden, it got quiet and something that Zushk nor the anim animals had ever seen before came floating out of the bag one by one. These bright lights floated to the sky and that is where they remain today. And that is how the stars came to be. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to this story this evening about Zushk. He's such a curious character. He seems to be always getting into trouble. And old man Zawaish, he was expressing, you know, the core value of generosity. And I hope you and your family are able to come together, you know, whether it's around the fire or, you know, any during um, event um, in your community that you're able to express some of those core values of love, compassion, respect, um, generosity that has been showed into this story. Um, so you take care of your family and yourself, and um, we will all be seeing each other real soon.
Kwatsi, Keshe, greetings, and welcome to Stories by the Fireside. This is the Indian Public Cultural Center's winter storytelling feature, and we welcome you to our facility here at the Indian Public Cultural Center. The Indian Public Cultural Center, its responsibility to our public communities is to ensure that the culture, the narrative, the legacy, and the heritage of our peoples is continued, and we continue to do that certainly utilizing many tools and resources, and certainly we welcome you today and we thank you that you are able to join us. Winter stories have always been an important part of our culture and our society. Before colonization to the Western Hemisphere, the oral narrative was an essential way in which groups of people, communities, were able to pass along information, core values, how to be a good parent, how to be a good uh, partner, how to do this and how to do that. So the oral narrative has always remained an important part of our culture. So we are welcoming you to our winter storytelling feature. And so I'm going to tell you a story that has been part of the Zuni culture. The Zuni Pueblo is one of the current 19 Pueblos. It's one of the Pueblos that was visited amongst the first groups of Spaniards who came here in the early 1500s. But it's the culture and the heritage of that storytelling component of our society that helps us sustain many of the important core values of us as a society and certainly as a community. One of the features or one of the uh, focuses concepts of this particular story is twofold. One is that we receive gifts from our creator and from nature. And it's by utilizing and respecting these gifts that we get a chance to sustain ourselves as a society. And the other component is the how we treat one another, the respect that we give one another, and certainly the respect that we give to our ancestors, those who, who have preceded us. So this is the story. The story is called A Dragonfly's Tale. It's a story which has been woven in time into our Zuni Pueblo. It's timeless. It's still very relevant in the year 2021 because it helps us understand those two components being a component or being a member of a community and a society, respecting those who have preceded us, and most importantly, being responsible and respectful and good stewards of those things we find in nature. The Dragonfly's Tales begins like this, and we should, whenever we tell stories, we should always begin at the beginning. We should always have a story that begins at the start. So, many lifetimes ago, in the days of the ancient ones, our ancestors, there lived a tribe or a group of people known as the Ashiwi or Ashiwi. Their village was called Hawiku and it sat on top of a hill. The houses were built side by side, one upon another, in the shape of a great honeycomb. Two great powerful spirits, good powerful spirits, they were called maidens of the white corn and maidens of the yellow corn. They watched over the village and the people of Hawiku. Each spring, they sent warm winds to chase away and melt the snows that had accumulated during the wintertime. In the summer, they would send friendly rains to, to nourish the fields, the people, and the animals of the people of Hawiku. This allowed their civilization and their society to expand. The corn crops grew straight and tall, along with the help of the corn maidens. There was the blessings that they received every year. Year after year, the people harvested more and more food than they could sustain or they could eat, and their storehouses accumulated more and more food, and they were able to be thankful for those crops that they were able to harvest. One day, however, after the last of the, all the ripe corn had been harvested and gathered, a group of children were having a mud fight, as children oftentimes do because they enjoy playing together. Their laughter echoed down the halls and the streets of Hawiku as they were playing and throwing playful clumps of dirt and mud. At the same time, the head chiefs of the tribe saw the game that the children were playing. Watching the children play, they thought of a plan to perhaps maybe flaunt or show off the great harvest that they had collected. They called a meeting of all the elders to talk about this and decide what they wanted to do. One of them said, the Awashi must celebrate this rich harvest with a, mock battle, with a mock battle, proclaimed one of the leaders. Our weapons will be made of bread, batter, and dough. And we're going to invite all our neighbors, basically to show how well we've done, how good off we are. And this way, maybe they'll become jealous. How will we ca carry out this envious prosperity when we are using our food, one of them asked. 
Well, it's just a way that we can sort of show off what we have done, all the good and hard work that we've done. But they were forgetting about the blessings of the corn maidens. Then one of the elders said, yes, yes, in agreement, let's begin. And they all began to praise one another and show that their cleverness was more than their thankfulness for the resources that the corn maidens had given them. At the same time, the corn maidens who disguised themselves as old women followed through the village wondering what the people were doing. The elders had ordered the people to prepare the f for the festivities. They sent swift runners for all the other communities that surrounded Hawiku to summon everyone and also to let others know that they were going to have this big event. Excited, the people were busy working. They were chopping wood. They were baking bread. They were doing all the things in getting ready for this big event, preparing and grinding cornmeal and also breaking the kinds of bread that they were going to use. The cooking fires roared, much like this fire in the fireplace here. It crackled and the smell of burning juniper was seen, smelt everywhere. The air was sweet with the smell of baking bread and boiling corn mush. On the day of the celebration, the corn maidens decided to see what was going on, what was all the excitement for all the people that was going on in Hawiku. So they disguised themselves as old, older women, old battered women, and they sort of limped through town to see what's going on. And since they really didn't notice who they were, no one really saw who these people were, and they simply saw them as old women walking through the village. At the crowded plaza, the corn maidens wondered why were everybody working so busy making corn and doing all the things that they, they were doing. Everywhere they saw bowls and baskets filled with batter and dough, all the bread was surrounded, and everywhere they found was all kinds of bread and food laying around. The mounds of cake were steaming in the windows. Stacks of bread were kind of corned up, cornered up in the, in the corners. They came, across a little boy, they came across a little boy and a little girl who sat by munching, uh, eating some corn cakes which were drenched with honey. When they saw the old battered and tattered women who were coming by, they held their hands out and offered friends some food. But one of the elders came by and quickly snatched away the food. He scolded the children, saying, No, no, the food is not for old beggars and old women. We should celebrate for what we have. These women are too lazy to grow their own corn, said the leader. They are like hungry coyotes, always looking for an easy, free meal. So the people continue to be very busy building the bread, baking the bread, building their fires, and getting ready for this big festivity. But we must remember that the festivity was basically simply to show how prosperous and how hardworking they were to simply praise themselves for all the hard work, but forgetting about the blessings that the corn maidens had given. Suddenly, the plaza grew very silent as the chief and the other leaders began to divide the people into two groups, into two, two clans, that they would decide who's going to be one side and who was going to be on the other side. Then, with a nod of the head, this great food battle began, much like sometimes we have food battles at school when we throw food at one another. But we know now that throwing food at one another can be wasteful. However, everybody was having such a good time. They were laughing, they were ducking. It's like when they were playing dodgeball. It was fun, but they were really forgetting what the blessings brought them that they had so much food. There was flying bread and biscuits and corn cakes flying all around. One team hurtled balls of dough while the other team th threw globs of batter at one another, certainly laughing and having a very good time. They had invited other neighbors from other pueblos to come and see what was going on, but they were really just simply saying in their greed how well off they were and perhaps maybe helping the others become jealous of the benefits that the people had had at Hawiku. The invited neighbors stared in bewilderment or they were kind of under, wondering what was going on and why their hosts were wasting all this precious food. After the battle and after the food fight was all gone, everybody returns back to their homes because it had been a very busy day. However, during this period of time, the corn maidens, the yellow corn maiden and the white corn maiden watched what was going on, but they were very sad, simply because the people had forgotten about the blessings that they had received from the corn maidens, but also sad that the people were being very wasteful. They had blessed the Ashawi with the abundance of food, good crop, warm weather, 
plentiful and friendly rains, and they were wondering why the people were behaving this way. It was like they were throwing all the gifts that the corn maidens had brought. One of the corn maidens said, you know, it's time that we should teach our children that they should learn a lesson, that they should become respectful, they should not be wasteful with the, the gifts that they received. The other corn maiden said, well, we need to do something that will help them understand that we don't do this simply to punish, but to help them learn a lesson. So they began to work on a plan to teach the pe people of Hawiku this lesson of how not to be wasteful, how not to be prideful, and how not to be uh, show-offish to one another and to other neighbors. When the games ended, the guests all went home, and they were certainly tired and uh, tired and um, just wanted to get some rest. At night, while the moon rose over the town, what happened was all the rodents, other eaters, other mice, and other animals came and found the food still laying all over on the ground, and the seed gatherers, the seed eaters, all came looking for also free meals. Suddenly, armies of mice and gophers and birds, bugs, and other animals began to carry all the way, carry away all the food that the people had wasted in their food fight. Then they tunneled, and then they were tunneled into the storerooms and stole all the corn that the people had stored throughout the year because of the plentiful harvest. They worked all through the night, and for the and for that time, they were rewarded with all the food that the people had wasted. They had been informed by the corn maidens that the people were wasteful and prideful, that they had wasted all this food, and so it was a time to show them a lesson, and they used the animals to help the people of Haviku understand that waste, wasting food, being prideful, and certainly not respecting the gifts of the nature and the corn maidens was not a good thing for the people of Haviku. When the people woke up, they could hardly believe their eyes the next morning. All the wasted food that they had left covering the village, covering the streets, and all the walls had suddenly disappeared. It had gone somewhere. They didn't know. But at the same time, another one of the community members in the village went to the storerooms to find all the storerooms were empty. All the corn they, they had planted and stored for the winter, all the vegetables, the beans, squash, and other foods that they had grown, that was all gone too. They really wondered where everything had gone. Who cares, said one of the elders. We have more corn enough to, to handle ourselves through the winter. We can always grow more corn. This was the pride that the community members had gotten up into their minds. And it wasn't until they realized that there was really no way to replenish all the food. Unfortunately, like every year, winter comes around like it is now. And slowly but surely, the days grew shorter, the, the nights grew colder, and it was when the cold, cold winds of winter came and then the snows, they came and began to cause the people to, under, to realize how bad they had behaved. They tried to make amends by saying their prayers, doing their activities, commemorating their ceremonies to try and get some way to relieve their hunger because they had no more food in the places that they had stored food. The priests sang their songs, they did their songs and dances, they tried all their previous rituals to try and get away to relieve their hunger and fulfill their stomachs because they had no food. But the corn maidens refused to respond to their requests for blessings because they were trying to help their people of Hawiku understand of the greed and the, the pride that they had. They were never able to grow any corn for until the next, um, they were never able to grow any corn. This happened for two more summers. The corn that they had normally depended upon was very, um, very, small, very few in amount. The rains never really came. There was really a significant impact on the way the corn was growing. And a second winter came, and now the people were very, very hungry. They were so hungry that they had to start eating cactus. They were eating other forms of, veg of plants that they were able to find but they never really were able to replenish the corn that they had wasted the two summers before. Again, summer came and went, and winter came upon them, and they were being very, very hungry, and certainly very mindful of the, of the pride that they had um, displayed. At the same time, the leaders were still very prideful. They were still thinking, well, we need to do something to make sure we, our people are fed. Where do we go? 
Where should we go to? We must remember this was a time when there was no grocery stores or things where people could buy things. People had to grow all they had and they depended upon one another. We need to go to ask our neighbors for help, said one of the other leaders. And if we delay any longer, we might even die because we're so hungry. So the people decided to leave their village. They dressed up in their warmest coats and blankets that they had, and they decided to go out in the snow and head to some of the nearest villages that they had actually asked to come and watch them with their food fight. However, in getting ready to leave the village, they unfortunately did something they did not know. And one of those things was they didn't realize that there were two children sleeping, that they were nice and warm in their bed, but they had forgotten that they were there. So they left with these two children still asleep. During the night, the boy woke up and he climbed up the ladder up of the hole in the roof to see what was going on. And he didn't see anybody in the community. He didn't see anybody in the village. Although he was initially frightened, he knew he needed to com comfort his younger sister. He said, perhaps maybe they just went out for looking for food, but maybe they'll be back. But he really didn't know. So some, in one way, he tried to comfort his little sister. He decided to make her a toy. The toy was made out of a corn husks. He said, I'll make her a nice butterfly. While the little girl slept, he set out to work. He carved the little, body, the little butterfly's body out of a piece of corn stalk and corn cob. He made its legs out of straw. Carefully, he cut the wings of the brittle corn husks into wings, and the leaves were made so that they could show the many colors of the butterfly. Then he painted the insect from the, that he had created from the corn husks with many different colors to show that the beauty of the color of the butterflies was still very much a part of his imagination and his creativity. He formed a delicate pattern of lines on the corn leaves of the wings. The, the young boy admired, admired his creation, and although it did not look exactly like a butterfly, it was still something that his sister really appreciated. And let me show you here the picture of him. When he heard that there was no one else in the village, the little girl, his sister, began to cry. The corn stalk creature helped her forget of this, her sadness that day. All day she played with the beautiful little toy her, son, her, her brother had created for her. She played with it, threw it in the air, and it was it fluttered, or fluttered to the ground. It reminded her of the days when butterflies were flying out in the fields. She would say, please fly again, please fly again, and find us some food. For a moment, the little uh, toy with its brittle, we brittle wings fluttered as it was re responding to her request. Later, while the little girl slept, the little boy heard a buzzing sound. He said, what's that buzzing sound? How go find what it is? Looking up, he saw the butterfly spinning in the moonlight. Its wings were fluttering wildly, and he reached to touch the strange creature, then carefully untied it. The hummingbird, the, the small butterfly, was humming and darting around the room, like a regular butterfly you would see flying out in the wilderness. And it turns out the corn maidens had turned his toy into a beautiful butterfly, a creature. The creature flew south to the land of everlasting summer, where the, the yellow corn maiden and the white corn maiden lived. When he neared their home, he saw that they were busy in their garden as well, and saw that after a long journey he was tired. And for an instant he rested upon the silken tassels of a corn plant. The, the tassels of the corn stalk that we see when we see corn growing. Then he flew to another and gathering the pollen from one corn plant, taking it to another corn plant, and then so forth, until he finally came upon the white and the yellow corn maiden. The creature found the two spirits strolling in their garden fields, and they were, had green corn all around them. He told them of the, the story of the little boy and the little girl who were still hungry, and that the little boy had made the toy out of the corn stalks. The, the corn maidens responded, We will gladly help you, these two little ones who forgotten, were forgotten by the tribe. Then there, was, then, then there was once again a time when they offered us food, but they were, they were rebuked by one of the elders. But we know that they were kind and they understood that they were simply gifts that they wanted to share. So the creature thanked the corn maidens and happily flew back to the little boy and the little girl. 
When the children woke, the house was filled with baskets of corn and beans and squash and pumpkins. The mound of corn reached to the ceiling. The boy and his little sister danced for joy. But where was the cornstalk creature, the little girl asked. The little girl found him in a corner perched in a potted jar. He was still there, even though he was no longer that beautiful butterfly, but, it was the one, but the butterfly was the one that brought back the food for the little boy and the little girl. The boy and the girl had plenty to eat in the days that followed. As time passed, winter came upon them again. The winters blew cold, and then the snow came. But eventually, just like spring always happens, it continues to come back again. So one day when the children were out planting the corn, the boy sprinkled a handful of cornmeal onto the ground and thanked the corn maidens for their blessing. Then he poked the hose deep into the dirt and put the corn seed there. The little girl covered the kernels with earth and the corn maidens brought more rain for the corn to grow. That night a misty rain fell over Hawiku. By morning the children were surprised to see little tiny corn plants that were shooting through the soil. Through the soil. Long, long time, a long, long days passed and eventually the corn grew tall and straight and were able to produce many crops and an abundance of corn for the people to have. Happily, the boy and girl picked the ripest corns, dug a pit, and roasted them, and that's what we do today. We continue to roast and share corn with our neighbors. Thinking about those people who went off to see their neighbors? Well, initially the neighbors were very angry because they had been invited simply to watch the people at Habiku simply throw away their food. But eventually they were nice to them and allowed them to have some food. However, since this was home, since Habiku was their home, the people decided to return home. So as one night when the children slept, the people of Hawiku decided we need to go back home because that's really where our home was. Humbled by their mistake of being greedy and certainly being prideful, they realized that they had made a mistake in wasting food and not being respectful for the gifts that the corn maidens had provided. So when they came home, they saw the efforts of the little boy and the little girl who had planted all the corn they had seen all the blessings and the gifts that were given to them by the white corn maiden and the yellow corn maiden, and they realized that they had made a mistake. They said, their leaders said, we are now blessed by the corn maidens, and we should never forget the lessons we've learned. One of the elders noticed the little boy and the girl that they were on the edge of the cornfield. The little girl was holding the wonderful toy that her brother had made her out of the corn stalk. These two children, these two children are the ones that have allowed us to be blessed. We should always keep them in mind to when we tell the story of who we are as Ashui, that we should honor our re relatives, that we should always be respectful of the blessings we receive, and that the corn maidens have always looked out for us, and we should never forget that as a lesson. From that time on, the people of Habiku have always been mindful of the yellow and white corn maidens, the gifts they've provided, and what our nature has provided for us to live as a society. Cornfields have always thrived, rains have always fallen, we people have spoken our language and we continue to do that simply because of the blessings we receive. And what became of the cornstalk creature? To this day in the early spring or in the early summer, we see butterflies and dragonflies fly around our crops. Those we depend upon as pollinators to the crops that we grow. This is the story of our Pueblo people from the Pueblo of Zuni. It's a way for us to never forget that at this time when we talk about stories, when we talk about gifts and seasoning and families and spending time with families and friends, we should never forget about the gifts we receive and for those in our communities that help us learn to live as people and speaking our language is what gives us that sense of understanding. So I want to thank you all for joining us for our story time. We hope you will get a chance to visit us at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. We have a number of resources on our website that you can have access to and we hope that we can have a chance to hear from you either through Facebook or many other platforms. We would, we would simply love to hear from you and we hope you will visit us again. So uh, as the holidays comes around, our very many blessings to you, a safe and peaceful holiday. Don't forget to please wear your mask and let's work to make sure everyone is safe and healthy. Thank you for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed our stories. Please join us again virtually on December 11th, 18th, and 25th for more stories. 
If you're in the Albuquerque area, we also invite you to join us in our in-person event at the Indian Pueblo Culture Center from 5 to 7 p.m. on December the 18th for stories by the fireside, storytelling, and dance performances. Admission will be a new toy or new clothing item for ages 3 to 18. Many blessings to you and your families. We'll see you again soon. Thank you for joining.